Hello and welcome to NeuroInspire. Today we have Kelly McDonagall talking about how to push through life's challenges. But when you ask them, well, are you happy? Does it make you feel good? They actually started saying things like they were really frustrated and they felt like something really good was coming but they could never get satisfaction. And they actually seemed kind of anxious and out of it, totally distracted and uninterested in anything. And like the rats, they would refuse food. Uh, and, and they didn't want to do anything except give themselves this electric shock. And what we now know uh, from further investigation of this area of the brain is that what they were experiencing and what the rat was probably experiencing was the promise of happiness or the promise of reward. That when this area of the brain becomes activated, the brain believes something good is going to happen. And that belief, that anticipation is so strong, you are willing to do anything to get that promised happiness. This is one of the biggest mistakes that we make um, that can lead to our own willpower challenges. That we mistake the inner experience of desire or the inner experience of wanting for the experience of happiness. And what neuroscientists now know is that actually this area of the brain that the rats were stimulating and the human patients were stimulating is the area of the brain that is activated by all the things that we tend to get addicted to. Things like reality TV and drugs and cigarettes and food, crispy cream donuts and wine. Uh, our, our internet devices, everything that we feel like, oh, just one more, and then it'll be enough, but it never is enough. It's basically things that are activating this area of the brain that the rats were self-stimulating and humans were self-stimulating. And it turns out that um, one of the best ways to break free of any addiction, whether it's to food or to a substance or to shopping or to gambling, is to actually learn to distinguish the inner experience of desire which is actually quite stressful, and the experience of happiness or satisfaction. And whether it's with new drugs that are helping change the system of the brain, or whether it's techniques like mindfulness meditation that is teaching people how to tune in to the huge gap between wanting and actual happiness. This is one of the most promising areas of research in the science of willpower. Okay, so the second myth uh, that I'd like you to consider is this idea many of us have that willpower is a measure of our, our virtue. That when we are resisting temptation and we're being very focused and we're getting things done, that somehow that's because we're a good person or we're being good. And that when we give in to temptation, when we procrastinate, that we are being bad. And we tend to label our own behaviors, good and bad, virtuous and vice, or even sin. Uh, and we rarely think about willpower as actually just being the ability to do what really matters to us, what we really want in the long term, those choices that are consistent with our long-term goals and values. And uh, one of the most exciting areas to come out of the science of willpower over the last decade is this idea that willpower is really most accurately thought of as a muscle, a kind of literal strength that the brain and the body need to work together to help you remember your goals, focus your attention, override impulses, manage stress in the brain, in the body, and that this is a sort of a characteristic and fixed response of the brain and body, and your brain and body get better at it when you practice it. Just like if you were to practice lifting heavy weights, you would get better at lifting heavy weights, and then you could lift heavier and heavier things without getting tired and without having to give up. And it turns out that this is truly the best way to think about willpower, whether you're looking for the willpower to break a bad habit, or uh, reach your goals, or even just kind of become a better version of yourself, that um, the way to do it is to train, and to be willing to do things that are quite difficult, and even uncomfortable, knowing that each step you take is teaching the brain and the body how to exert self-control. And it turns out that even really small willpower workouts can teach the brain and body how to control much bigger and more difficult impulses and challenges. For example, one of my favorite studies uh, asked adults who were um, in a romantic relationship to, uh, to control what they did with their dominant and non-dominant hand. So you can imagine for two weeks having to open doors with your non-dominant hand instead of your dominant hand. And that simple training of having to pay attention to what you're doing and remembering what your goals are that simple training made those uh, adults less likely to abuse their romantic partners. That there was something about just training, paying attention, and regulating impulses uh, 
to something that seems almost irrelevant to the things we care about. You know, what hand you use to open doors. But that training, that basic process, is giving them more self-control for something I think we all would agree is, is a very important willpower challenge. And study after study shows this type of thing, that when you commit to doing one thing, whether it's training to run a half marathon, or learning to meditate, or even just improving your posture, that small changes that require you to practice awareness and remember what your goal is actually make it easier to accomplish much bigger challenges. So the second mistake, that, uh, the third mistake that many of us make, um, and is the one that I found is actually the hardest for people to give up, is the idea that you can use guilt and shame as a motivation. That when you feel bad about something you've done, the best way to make sure you don't do it again is to beat yourself up for doing it. You're stupid, you're lazy, what's wrong with you? And, uh, and you can actually think that may be a reasonable hypothesis, and scientists have looked at this. For example, researchers have looked at um, people who have problems with drinking and tracked their drinking over time and how bad they felt the morning after they drank too much. And you can guess, you know, maybe the worse they feel, so the guiltier they are, the more shame they are, the more motivated they will be to not drink again. Or you could guess that the guiltier and more shame they feel, the more they're going to need to drink right away. And that actually turns out to be the truth. And not just for people who have issues with drinking, but for dieters who break their diet and then go on to binge eat if they're feeling really guilty and ashamed. Or people who are feeling very guilty and ashamed about their debt, and so they go out and spend money to try to make themselves feel better. Um, because the things that we tend to feel the most guilty and ashamed about are the things that we actually turn to for comfort uh, or to soothe our own stress. And so when we try to use guilt or shame as some kind of motivation to change our behavior, it doesn't work for the one thing that we feel most guilty and ashamed about. And there's a whole new science evolving of self-compassion that shows that when you forgive yourself for a setback, whether it's procrastinating or uh, breaking a resolution or yelling at your kids, the faster you can forgive yourself, the faster you can remember your goal and the more likely people are to succeed at a change. In fact, just learning uh, a one-day self-compassion training for people who have struggled with binge eating their whole lives, one-day self-compassion training uh, tripled the long-term success rate that that group had in losing weight over the course of a year compared to people who were using the same old strategies and basically beating themselves up for not yet being perfect. The fourth myth and big misunderstanding that we have about willpower is the idea that um, we need to change what's going on inside of us before we can make a real lasting change in our actions and our behavior. Things like, like guilt and anger and anxiety and confusion. Um, if you imagine someone who's procrastinating because they're feeling really anxious about the thing that they're putting off, uh, many of us would think, well, I gotta fix that anxiety first. I need to work on it, I need to soothe it, I need to get rid of it, and then I'll be able to tackle the thing that I'm afraid of. Um, or the smoker is waiting to stop needing nicotine in order to quit. Or the, the person who's going to start exercising as soon as they stop eating exercising. Like, I'll do it when it's easy. And many of us can spend a lot of time trying to fix these inner experiences, but the science now is suggesting that the more you try to fix your inner experiences, to push anxiety away so you can do what you're afraid of, or to deny the cravings that you have, uh, as sort of a form of self-control. The more you resist your inner experiences, the stronger they get. And the only way to actually transform inner experiences like cravings or anxiety, other emotions and stress, is a kind of jujitsu, you kind of, it's a kind of a paradox. You actually have to accept them and focus on changing your behavior first. 